Okay, welcome to our Tuesday in game class. Um, could you keep it down over there? Oh, thank you. So many people here. Um, unlike other end game classes where I show lots of different weird stuff, we're going to actually look at four games that I played, although not the whole game, between 2009 and 2011 when I hadn't lost my faculties yet. So I was actually playing pretty well. Um, I think probably between 2004 and 2009 was my peak strength, and then I started going downhill. Um, okay, so first game is against Florin Felican, and, and I don't think this is the game. In fact, it's not because it's Chicago Open. I've, Florin lived in Chicago. I think he still does. He's an FM slash IM. I think he's an IM now. Um, I remember the first time I played him, I offered him a draw pretty early because I was it was the last round that I had to drive home to Michigan. So, and he declined and I won. And he said, "Oh, I just didn't take a draw because we never played before, so I wanted to play you." So, okay, this is a different game. So, we had played before, um, but I didn't have to drive home because this was round six. So, okay. So um, the ending is we're going to look at our positions where I would call them 50-50 positions. Um, and then at the grandmaster level, we call it playing for two results. So you have a position where you have virtually no losing chances, um, and you may win, you may draw. So that's why I call it 50-50. You win half the time, you draw half the time. Okay, now, as usual, I have my own ideas about chess that are different than the mainstream. So um, when I see opposite color bishops, um, I just assume I'm going to win unlike other people who assume it's a draw. And actually, opposite colored bishops are often have more drawing chances when that's all there is on the board. When there's other pieces, opposite colored bishops don't mean anything. So in this position, I would say white is more likely to win than draw for the obvious reason white's up a pawn. So when white's up a pawn or white's up two pawns or three pawns, I assume you're going to win. And sometimes when you're up a pawn or two pawns and even sometimes three pawns, and it's opposite color bishops, it's a draw. It occasionally happens. Okay, so uh, my opponent played bishop b6 with the obvious threat. Somebody. Rook f2, right. Bishop f2 is probably also good. Rook f2, black's better. Okay. Now, they're coming in droves, unlike in Blazing Saddles when they were staying in droves. Staying in, coming in droves. Actually, the joke was pretty similar. All right. So, um, in end games, one thing that you want to do is stop working at six instead of seven so you can come to my lectures, right? Was it six or five? What? Six. What time did you stop today? Yeah, six. Six. Okay, so you got here quicker than usual. It was the most fun traffic you've ever. Yeah. Okay, so it's end game lecture, and we're talking about what you want to do in this kind of position. So in all end games, there's things that you want to do, and one of them, which I say over and over and over, is move your king up the board, and the other one is create past pawns, push your past pawns, promote your past pawns, checkmate with the queen, or with a knight, if you're Nakamura. Okay, never made that joke. Anyway, so since my pawn is attacked on f2, and since I want to create a passed pawn, I've given away what move I made. See, I just told the audience what move I made. They can all say it in unison. Anybody? It's White's turn, by the way. F4. F4. Now, it's obviously an F3 for two reasons. That doesn't create a passed pawn and never play F3. Now, I already have a passed pawn, so I guess F4 doesn't create a passed pawn. However, if he doesn't take on F4, I will potentially have two passed pawns. So, okay, so he did take. And now we can vote. I'm betting on 3-0. That's I'm betting. Let's hold on a second. I left my phone. I can't bet. Too bad. Uh, did I take with the rook or the pawn? What's that? Pawn. Pawn? What'd you say? Rook. Rook? I, I guess it won't be 3 0. It's, it's 1 to 1. No. I guessed wrong. Um, I don't know. 
What's it? One to one to one. <laughs> we have one abstention. Pawn. Okay. Pawn. 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 Okay, so it's two to one. So it has to be pawn because it's two to one. Yeah, you don't take with the rook. That breaks my rule never trade. And also, if I took with the rook, I wouldn't win. Because if you play rook takes, see, the problem was you weren't here when the lecture started. And I said, opposite color bishops are always winning unless that's all that's on the board. Then there's drawing chances. Okay, the reason we don't win is we're never going to queen this pawn, we're never going to queen this pawn, and we're never going to queen this pawn because king goes to f6 and sits there. So the easiest way for black to draw here is to play b4, obviously. I'm sure you're all thinking that. Okay, and the reason is we don't want to lose this pawn. So if white plays b4 and then bishop to d7, we might lose that pawn. We won't, but we might. If I go here and then put my bishop here and put my king here, nobody will beat me or you unless they cheat. Then they might beat you. Okay? There's no way to possibly win. You want to keep the rooks on the board. So I took with the pawn. Okay. And my opponent played bishop c5, which stops me from playing b4 and defends his d6 pawn. I played king f3, obviously, because you move your king up the board. And he played b4, and he's like, well... That stuff that I said before when the rooks weren't on the board, that still applies. I'll never queen any of my pawns. They're all blocked horribly. So what I can do is I can eventually push my F pawn to where it's unstoppable or too strong. Or I have another winning method, which I've used before, which is to create more passed pawns, which would require an exchange sacrifice. So for example, if my pawn was on f5 and defended forever and I could walk my king in, eventually my rook could come and I could sacrifice and I would have two passed pawns. If I have two passed pawns, I might win. Um, also, there's a very strange way to win this game, which I ended up doing. And this actually happens in opposite color bishops endings more often than not and in, and in same color bishop endings. I would say of all end games, this idea happens the most in bishop and pawn endings. Although it also happens a lot in king and pawn endings. And that's Zugzwang. Because this bishop's defending this pawn and the bishop's defending this pawn. So if the bishop moves, that could be bad. If the bishop doesn't move and it's black's turn to move, you, you got to move something. So later that actually happened. Okay, so king e4, obviously. Move your king up. He played king g7 because there's no winning plan for black, for white. So he's just chilling. I mean, I have a passed pawn, but he's stopping it pretty well. Also, I like the move king g7 because he put all of his uh, pieces on the dark squares so my white square bishop can't ever trick him. Okay, check. He goes in front of my pawn. g6. And I play b3, and he has to make a move. That'll teach him. And if he moves his rook sideways, then my pawn's not blocked. If he moves it here, I can force his king to the back rank because his king can't go to f6. So he did boot his king up, and I checked him back. And I played rook h6 and put him in Zugzwang again. Now he can't play king f6. So he really doesn't want his king on the back rank. I've taught this in many lessons. Someday someone will listen. If you want to move your king up, that means your opponent does too. So if your opponent moves his king back, that would be opposite. So they don't want to move their king back. So if I can force his king to the back rank, that would be nice. Then his king would be on the back rank. I have extra king. Okay, he played bishop f2. He doesn't want to have his king on the back rank. He wants that if I check him, he can move his king up. Okay. And he, and he did. Okay. And I attacked his pawn. And do you think he should play bishop c5 or bishop e1? We could vote again. How does she defend this pawn I attacked? E1. 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 Well, I mean, I like the other, but you try to see why E1 is so good. Okay, well, you can say C5. It's okay. Yeah, I was C5. thinking off the top of my head I would more normally go to C5, and the reason is I don't really like C5 more than E1. I just like defending this pawn. So if the bishop's on E1 and the rook is attacking the pawn, you got to start defending it again, which may not be easy. If the bishop's on c5, you're, you're done. I don't know what he did because I forgot. I played this game in 2009. What do you want from me? Okay, he went to c5. Okay. Is it okay to get rid of, like, give up control of that f6 square with the bishop by moving there? 
Like, I mean, you could potentially move the bishop back to the h file to protect the... Or to well, would you be able to defend this pawn, then? You want to get your bishop over here? I guess. I'm just wondering, is that still necessary to think about with the bishop? You, you could, but you're... I mean, I don't think you can defend that, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And now, I play king f4, and everything I said before came to fruition. So I guess I'll leave. Oh, I, I'll stay here. This was a great tactic of the great international master Emery Tate. I'm sure you guys know that. Any of you heard of Emery Tate? You two have? Neither one of you have? Wow. Emery Tate was a very interesting man. He died during a tournament game. And he was a very aggressive player and person. Um, and he was a very aggressive lecturer. <laughs> um, anyway, um, he would often leave the room during a lecture to show to, to show you. He's like, and then I went here, then he would leave. And you'd be like, wow. So, okay. So um, well this is this is really Zugzwang. This is this is the Zung Zugzwangiest. So maybe Bishop E1 was better, because there's less Zugzwang. And when I say Zugzwang, there's no legal king moose for black. We agree. And if you move your rook, I'll play rook f7 mate. So that's probably not a good idea. By the way, there's more checkmates in every position when it's opposite color bishops. That's just, it's, other bishop can't do anything. So you're controlling more square, more, you know, I'm controlling one whole color of, this, of the board. So you have to move the bishop because you don't want to get mated in one move. Then you lose your b-pawn. Okay. Yay. Still hard to win though, because how do you win? Not easy. Okay. Now, unfortunately, for players who aren't super grandmasters, they're very impatient, which helps me because they, they're impatient. They make a lot of mistakes. I'm very patient. Okay. And that's why I'm not so good now as I was then because I'm much closer to death than I was in 2009. So I got to, I got to make a move. And who knows, right? Emery Tate. Okay. So back then I would do nothing forever. You could ask any of my wives. They'll tell you. Yeah. In fact, one's right there. Yeah. I don't do nothing. Okay. And I learned that from an episode of The Simpsons, because you got to learn something from The Simpsons. Um, and I've mentioned this before, but you guys weren't here. Um, you weren't in St. Louis like several years ago, were you? Uh, there's an episode where Homer's a boxer, but he has no strength. So when he hits something, nothing happens. So Mo says, we're not getting in a boxing match there. You just stand there. And when the guy gets tired from hitting you, then you could nudge him over. And that's how he wins all of his fights. The guy just keeps hitting him until he's exhausted and keels over. That's how he wins. Okay, That's actually how I like to win at chess. Even though they were kidding, the truth hurts. I just do nothing for a long time, and then my opponent gives all the pieces away. And actually, I was accused of doing this in tennis. And this was the 1994 U.S. Championship, not the U.S. Tennis Championship, um, in Key West, Florida. I was playing tennis with Kaidenov, and when we were done, he's like, it's like hitting it against the wall. You just always hit it back. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. Now, I didn't hit it back good, but if I hit it back every time, I won't lose any points. Unless I'm playing somebody good, then I'll lose every point. Okay, but. So in chess, I try not to do very much. Now here, I have two obvious plans, because I have a passed pawn here, and I have a passed pawn here. So I'll try to queen one of them, although that's not so easy. Okay. Also, I don't want to like lose my rook and lose the game, because that would be bad. Luckily, it's my move. Okay, king d3, and he gets his rook active, and I activate my king. And then I defend my pawn, because his rook's on my pawn, so I can't move my rook anywhere. So now I can move my rook somewhere. Okay, here comes the passed pawn. And I have another passed pawn. Yeah, hooray, two passed pawns. Okay, I play king c4. What's black's threat? If black could move again, what would he do? Yeah, bishop c3 attacks my pawn, and I can't do anything about it. So I, I stop that. Yay. Okay. Also, I would have accepted bishop c5, but I didn't see it. But I would have accepted it, because now I see it. So. Okay, so king c4, stopping everything. Rook h7, waiting. And I defend my pawn, so my king can move up. And my king moved up. So he has a problem here. 
obviously you don't want my king to move up and then move my pawn. But if you stay on my pawn, which you could do, that would stop my king from moving up. Then you're not staying on this pawn. So for example, if you go here, I go here, threatening rook c8 mate. And you have to be a better player than me to do something good about that. You have to give up all your pieces on b4. Rook b4 check. Probably not good. But yeah, this is a big threat. So you can't let me play f6. But unfortunately, I play king c6. And now this guy's coming. Yeah. And my king is better than his king. And I've said this in many, 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 many lectures. And in fact, wow, this game was played... Um, five months before a game that I lecture on a lot, which I'm sure you, I, you could all say in unison to tell you, um, the game between Zenyuk and Foyzor. And I'm sure you've memorized that game. And in the zenyuk Foyzor game, White was a pawn up in the ending in the U.S. Women's Championship. And they played about 12 moves, and White's king didn't move, and Black's king moved all the way down the board, and White was lost because Black had a king and White didn't. And I didn't see the interim move, so I was really confused. Like, the kings were, like, on G1 and G8, and then Black's king was on E2 and White's king was on H1. And I was like, what? what? What happened? And what happened was White kept checking the Black king up the board so she could take a pawn or two. And then, okay. Now, here, you, you've been here. You're sitting in the audience. My, my king wasn't here when we started, and, and his king wasn't here, but that's what happened. His king went back, and my king went forward, and I'm up two pawns, and there's no checks. So he resigned. If I turn the engine on, probably the number is higher than you would suspect. I would guess. Yeah, I would think it would be higher than that. But okay, it's pretty high. It'll get to like plus seven or eight in maybe five minutes. That's pretty good when you have two pawns. But yeah, I have a king and you don't. And my bishop is better. And my king is shielded from checks by my rook. My pass pawn is unabated. And if this pawn ever gets to f6, you have to watch out for back rank mate. Yeah, there we go. Plus eight. And now we're talking. Yeah. Okay, my opponent resigned. So I did two very important, three very important things there. I won another pawn. I advanced my king and my opponent didn't. And I advanced my pawns. When, when the start of my pawn was on F2, now it's on F5. And this pawn is unstoppable. Okay, so that was when I was good. Okay, and this is against Julio Becerra. This is a funny game. This is the last round in Vegas. And actually, it was shown live on the internet. And we both had three and a half out of five. And whoever won would like tie for fourth or fifth. Something like that. Um, so a draw wasn't good. Now Julio is a very aggressive player. And he's a very good blitz player. He's a better player than I am, as you can see by the ratings. In fact, those ratings don't make any sense. My rating is obviously my FIDE rating. Um, if that's his FIDE rating, then he's better than I thought he was. It might be. Probably is. Yeah. And obviously, he's from what country before he moved to the U.S.? Spanish. Well, they speak Spanish there, but it's yeah. much, much closer than Mexico. Spanish. What's that? Mexico. Even closer, which doesn't make any sense because that's the closest. Cuba. Cuba, yeah. And Well, if you're in Florida, it's closer. Um, he's Cuban. In fact, a funny story about that. Uh well, this was in the National Open in 2009. In 2000, I'm going to say six. I'm within two years. There was a U.S. championship in San Diego, and there were five players who were from Cuba, but they play for the U.S. now. And they were playing in the tournament. And one round, all five players had black, and they all won. That's not going to happen anymore. So that's, that's it. That's the only time that's going to happen. So if you're at home and you're looking on the internet, I'm sure you could find it. I think it was 2006, but I'm, maybe 2005. Um, and, of course, Julio was one of them. Um, I think Julio, well, I don't know now. He was the best Cuban player in the U.S. Then um, Fidel Corrales was probably higher rated, but now he's probably lower rated. Anyway, as you all know, I like to talk about Nakamura in my videos because you know, I like him so much. Um Julio was playing Nakamura in the U.S. Chess League about seven years ago, and Julio won in about 11 moves. The, the game ended. It wasn't like he was winning and then he won. Then he, Nakamura resigned. So, yeah, um, very suspicious. So Julio's not bad. Okay, so he took. And we have this end game where, once again, I would say it's sort of like a 50-50. Um, 
you know, whites up a pawn, but there's not many pawns on the board, and my opponent has a pretty serious passed pawn. He's not kidding. I thought he was kidding, but he wasn't. So this move should be pretty easy for you guys. I, I have faith in you. What did I do in this position? Yeah, you got to stop that pawn, otherwise you're going to lose. Right. Okay, now this should be a win because there's pawns on both sides of the board, which is very helpful, and I have two passed pawns already, so I should win. The way you wouldn't win, other than blundering your knight, which I've done, is you trade too many pawns. And if you have like a knight and a pawn against a bishop, you're not going to win. As in the game that was played yesterday, I'm sure you all know. They really don't know stuff. Uh, Ding Lirin versus Magnus Carlsen. They actually had knight and pawn versus bishop. It happened. I, I saw it. And then Magnus had the knight and pawn, but he couldn't move his pawn because the guy would take it. So they played like 20 moves and Magnus said, okay, draw. Okay, so I can't trade all the pawns off because then I won't win. Okay, C2. So obviously I played here. Now you might say, wait a minute, why did he give his passed pawn up? What's wrong with him? Well, you're going to lose your passed pawn. I'm going to play king d3, and I'm going to play knight d4. If you don't like that, I could play king d3 and then move my knight somewhere else to d5 or e2 or d1. I'm going to take that pawn. So instead of losing the pawn for nothing, you might as well get something for it. There's no way you're going to save your pawn. After c2, I have to play... King to d2. And after bishop b2, I have to play... King takes yeah, so he got a pawn for his pawn, and now there's fewer pawns on the board. Okay, and I play king b3, and he played, obviously, bishop c1 and e4. Okay, he moved his king up, because that's what we do. I moved my king up, because that's what we do. He moved his king, and I threatened his pawn, and he saved it, the only way you can save it. And I played knight d3. I like the knight on d3. Now you like it, because it attacks a bishop. So your, your blood pressure just went down. You're like, oh, I attacked a bishop. He has attacked the bishop in like three moves. You're getting really upset over there. I like it because my pawn controls white squares and my knight controls the dark squares. So that means his king isn't going to walk in and take my pieces. In fact, this is how you checkmate with bishop and knight. If your bishop's on a white square, you're going to need the knight to control dark squares. Now to do this, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Or maybe I'm not thinking of it. But I can't think of it, but I'll think of it later on. Just yell it out. You'll be confused. Um, strangely, if you want your knight and pawn to control different colors, they have to be on the same color. Makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paradoxically. I didn't yell it really loud. Okay. So the knight's controlling the... Okay. So I like my knight on d3 a lot. I like it a lot. Because his king can't do anything. Also, I'm threatening his bishop. So you guys like it. Okay. And b5. What is b5 called in chess? What did I just do? Is that called close the position? Mm, which answer is worse? Yes, <laughs> nobody, nobody knows. Yeah, definitely not Zugzwang. I mean, I closed the two files. It yeah, it's called fixing the pawn structure, fixing your opponent's oh. pawns. Yeah. Again, my opponent wants to push the pawns. If I was black, I'd probably go here. That way, if there's a trade, there's like no pawns on the board. If there's not a trade, there's a passed pawn there. So b5 fixes the pawn structure on the queen side. And I fix it on the color of his bishop, which will confuse most of you. So when you're a low-rated player, <clears throat> you guys need a fire extinguisher because your ears are burning. When you're lower rated, you often will put your pawns on the wrong color because you want them to be safe. And in an end game, you do not want the pawns on the color of your bishop then you control nothing. You got nothing. So there's no control of the white squares. If the pawns were on the white squares, they would be able to move and you would control every square on the board. Here your pawns can't move and you control nothing. So I can go to knight c6, I can play king b7, and you, you can't move your bishop. So your, your, your b6 pawn is pretty safe, I'll give you that, but you got nothing going on here. So you don't want to be safe you want to trade pawns and get past pawns. Now, there are positions where you do want to be safe, but not here. I have two past pawns on the king side. You got to be active. So b5 is a very obvious move to a grandmaster, but a weaker player might be like, "Oh boy, I can I can win some pawns here." 
But after B5, it's very clear that white's going to win because I basically am two pawns up now. And a lot of beginners are very confused about the en passant rule and they're confused as to why it exists. This is actually a good reason. If the en passant rule did not exist, then B5 doesn't really make any sense. But because it exists, my one pawn stops his two pawns. Okay, then if en passant didn't exist, nobody would play B5 there. You can't ask a question. Incorrect. Why, why would it have been bad to walk the king in there? And oh, I, I didn't say it was bad. Yeah, but it's obvious to play b5. Now, one issue on playing king b5, which is reasonable, is he could play the move a5. And then we would trade all the pawns off. And that should be a winning ending, but I'm not sure. The reason I'm not sure, like, I think it's a winning ending. I, I know this is a winning ending. Well, that's that's easy because you don't want to trade pawns. And so if there's no pawns on the board, I will not win. Now my b5 pawn will never be captured, ever. So I'm always going to win when you sacrifice a piece on the king side, even if you win both of my pawns. In this situation, that's no longer the case. Now, if white's king was on f3, I have no doubt this is a win. But with a king on a5, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know if, I mean, this, this king's not so good over here. So it might be winning, but it might not be. But b5 is 100% winning because if you ever sacrifice your bishop for both my pawns, you can resign. I have this pawn. That pawn can never be captured. Okay, so king e6. Otherwise, I play king d5. Knight b4. I'm going to c6. And g4. And that's why you want pawns on both sides of the board. Yeah. I'm going to hurt his neck looking at both sides. Bishop h6. And again, I didn't play knight c6 for the obvious reason he would play. I'll accept two answers. Uh, a5. Yeah, a5 or a6. I don't know which one's better. I'm not sure. Which one's better? Let's see. A5. A5's a draw. Wow, not even better. Man, you'd think I'd be better. I'm up a pawn, but no. Okay. So I didn't do that. I played knight d3 again. And I'm very patient because now with the knight on d3, I can't do anything. If you were white and you wanted to go forward, you can't. Can't play knight c5, can't play knight e5, can't play knight f4, can't move your king up, can't move your pawns up. But that's okay. My knight on d3 stops his king forever. So I, I could do something like this and you can't even approach my pawn. Because my knight on d3 is so good. But I think I can just play e5 and walk my king over this way. So I think I have more than one way to win. Well, he stopped that way to win. Oh, well. I tried to move my king over, but he stopped me. Knight d e1. That was a very good move, actually. Where am I going? F3. F3, even better than d3. Then my king can go to d3. My knight controls both squares. And if you try to walk your king in, then I have knight g2 check winning your bishop. So you can't walk your king in. Okay. And he realized you're a king f4. Well, he probably realized it before. Okay. So he's bishop, g5. If he takes my pawn, then this is a very easy win. Because I can win by, actually I can win by stalemating him. Then he has to move his a pawn. Or I can win by just taking his pawns. Okay. This is probably more fun. This is sort of a masochistic way to win. And then he has to move his a pawn, and then you take it, and, and you promote to an I, Nakamura style, and mate. Confusing the audience. Yeah, but obviously promote to an I, frankly. I could have made a bishop and played bishop c6 mate. I could have made a bishop, waited till he queened, then played bishop c6 mate. That's also mean. Okay, anyway, he's not going to take my pawn because it's a losing endgame. So he played bishop f8 because... Always play bishop f8. Okay, I checked. He has to move up because moving back is hopeless. Now he's threatening everything. And when I played knight f3, I had this move in mind in case he played king f4. I don't recommend you do this at home. Even though I was a thousand percent sure it was winning, I was still worried when I did it. What did you do? E5? I did play e5, yeah. And he did what any good grandmaster would do here. He resigned. If you take my knight, 
I'm just in time. Boy, that was lucky. And I could push either pawn. And yeah, that was lucky, wasn't it? Yeah. So you can't take my knight. And then if you don't take my knight, that's also not good. If you turn the engine on, which I did about two hours ago, uh, you're barely old enough to see the numbers. They're very large. They're getting close to triple digits. Can you just go F5? King F5? You can, and your long-term prospects aren't good. When I say they're not good, I, I wasn't kidding you. Mm. It'll get much, much higher the more it sits. It's like, wait a minute. Uh, it, it sees further ahead, and it sees that I queen. So it's like, oh, that's not good. Yeah, it gets to really high digits at some point. Yeah. It plays king f4. That's not very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, it suggests knight d2, which is silly. Obviously, I play king d5. Yeah, that's a funny move. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, now, now we're talking. Yeah, it gets much bigger, too. But it hasn't fought very long yet. Okay, and the fan's getting really loud, so that means it's not good. Yeah. So, okay, he resigned after he fought. So the key move in this ending, in my opinion, was the move you denounced. No, you didn't denounce it. Was b5. That ensured that I would win because my one pawn stops his two pawns. And if it ever is the case that he sacrifices his bishop on the king side, I, I still have a pawn. So and that was the last round. Hooray, I won like a dollar or something, if I remember correctly, okay, which I don't. Okay, I'm black, so I have to flip the board. This was also in the National Open of Vegas. This was the following year, 2010. Okay, I took with the knight. Okay, so this is a knight ending. That's nothing to sneeze at because I'm a pawn up. Yeah. And also bless you. So I'm up a pawn, and my opponent has an isolated pawn. So I would assume this is a win. I would be shocked if this was a draw because I have two advantages, my extra pawn and my better pawn structure. Okay, so... I move my king up, of course. Of course. Got to move your king up. Why do you move in that way and not through the h file? Where, where, where are you going? You could do that. I'm not sure what your long-term plan is, though. I, I guess, I guess, since everything's on that side of the board, why do you move the, your king to the other side where not everything's at? Well, I'm going to push my pawns. I don't want my king in front of them. Also, okay. you might find this funny. You might not. Imagine black played king f5, which is the furthest he can go up. The knight h4 is mate. mate yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah, so probably you got to be careful over there. It's a little, little crowded. Yeah. So I'm walking my king. And also, you know the two sides of the board theory. Pawns over here, pawns over here. I don't have any pawns over there. So if my king walks up the board, okay, I'm going to win. If he stops me, then he's moving away from his own pawns. So it's, it's good to move your king that way. Give him something to think about. Um, I could have gone the other way, but I think I have to play g5 then to get any action going. I don't want to play g5 I don't want to trade pawns. I want to keep all the pawns on the board. Okay, and we moved our knights to good squares, or so we thought. Okay, now if I play knight b4 check, I'll win. So he stopped me. Okay, and I fixed his pawn, because you guys like when I do that. And I'm going to get it. Go in both, and he played e4. Now he's going to trade all the pawns off, and we'll agree to a draw. So here we agree to a draw in advance. That way, no, I'm kidding. Okay, so I don't want to trade pawns. I have a passed pawn, and I attack all of his pawns, and he defended them all. Brar! And now we get into our zugzwang again. F5, and you can't move. You can't move any of your pawns, your king, or your knight. That's zugzwang. Obviously, you can't move your knight because I'll take all your pawns with check, and you're going to run out of pawn moves. And if your king moves, my king can move up the board. So he traded, what's and his e? king. Yeah, what's wrong with e5? Uh, I would play king d5, and you're in zugzwang again. You're going to have to move your king. Got, yeah. you, you can never move this. Whoa. You can never move this, because I'm going to take your pawns. And you can never move this, 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 or this. That's not good. I could just beat you like a king and pawn versus king. It's, your king's going to go all the way back. And when I stalemate you, it's not stalemate. You're going to move your knight. Yeah. Now, remember what I said earlier in the lecture. Maybe you don't remember. Who wants to trade pawns? White or black? And this white does. White, because if there's no pawns on the board, it's a draw. If there's a lot of pawns, I'll win. I have more pawns than he does. So he wants to trade pawns. Yeah. Okay. Now, 
I couldn't figure out how to win. So I actually triangulated, so it would be his move. In this position, if I play d3, he plays knight e3 check. You agree. It's true. Then my f pawn's hanging, my g pawn's hanging, my h pawn's hanging. However, what if it's his move? Exactly. I don't know what he would do if it was his move. If he moves his king to c2, for example, I play d3 check, and then I play king d4, and he can't play knight e3 to attack my pawn because knight takes h4, defends my pawn, and wins a pawn. So actually, I want it to be his move here, and I triangulated. I never triangulated a knight endgame, I must admit. So what happens if he moves d3 when you go to triangulate? King exactly. So let's go back. Okay, king, I played here. And now he should, you want him to play king d3 instead, which I agree with. Yeah. Now you can't play knight to d3 because you took that square away. So I can play this move. And if you play knight to e1, I play this move. And you have to go back to, to g2, which is unfortunate. Then I have the g6 move in reserve. Yeah. You really want to play knight to d3 when my knight goes to... Then you're, boy, then you're pretty solid. That's probably better than what he did. Yeah, now he can't move. It's his move. Yeah, now you have to move. So he played there. But it doesn't matter what he does. Um, and I took that pawn, defending my other pawn. And he resigned. Never triangulated with a, with a knight endgame before. But, as I've said in many, 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 many lectures, in a position where once they have the same piece, sometimes... Whoa. Oh, I put, oh, that's the wrong button. Why is that the wrong button? Okay. When you have the same piece, and this is usually a rook, but it's a knight here because it's a knight in here. When you have the same piece and your piece is attacking things and your opponent is defending things, that's a big advantage for the attacker. So my knights are attacking his pawns, his knight's defending his pawns, which means I can move my knight if I want to, but he can't move his knight. And when you have a rook and pawn ending and it's the same thing, and I lecture on this on Sunday, you... Terrible to have the piece that can't move. Okay, so that was uh, not too difficult. Okay, and least but not last. This was against Jesse Cry. And this was actually, let's flip the board again. This was in the, the U.S. Chess League when it was still the U.S. Chess League. This game was a long game. So we're on move 33, and we're not even close to being half over. Okay, my opponent played the obvious move. I'll give you guys an easy one. Takes A2. Takes A2. This is one of those 50-50 positions. Again, I'm up a pawn. All the pawns are on the same side. You know, who knows? But I'm very patient. Okay, so I attacked his H pawn. And I figured if he takes my pawn and I take his pawn, I have a passed pawn. I would rather have a passed pawn than not have a passed pawn. So he agreed. So I was like, all right, let's try something else. And... I played e4, and he played f6, breaking a very important rule. Yeah, remove your f pawn. That's not the rule. But you were very close. Never play f6. Very specific rule. And now I made a move which goes against my rules, but that's okay. Because that proves the exception proves the rule. And I broke one rule so I could follow another rule. I'm a very big fan of the Bible. I have to do one thing that tells you not to do another thing. It's very important to do that. Okay, and, and so I played a move that would shock you. Well, wait, that wasn't the move. I guess I played it later. Uh, rook b5. e5. That's the move that shocks you. Because I told you don't trade pawns when there's very few pawns on the board because then I won't win. But in this instance, I wanted to trade pawns because I like that pawn structure he had. The two isolated pawns far apart from each other. I like that. Yeah. Now, maybe bishop takes e5 draws. In fact, if I was black, I would play bishop takes e5. I don't agree with his decision. So, but he, he played bishop a3. I guess if you don't want to trade bishops, that's your only hope. And now I can trade bishops if I want by going here. And he has to break the pin with this, and I can trade bishops. But I don't, I think white should not trade bishops. I think black made a mistake, so I... Didn't trade bishops. And I kept my bishop. 
because I want to have a lot of pieces on the board so I can win. Also, I really like this bishop. Man, awesome bishop. Okay, check. Obviously, if he goes to f7, I'll take his pawn. So black has two big disadvantages in this position. One is he's down a pawn. That's the main one. The other is he has two isolated pawns and I have zero. So I would assume that I'm winning. The assumption. Threatening rook g7 check. And he attacked my bishop. And always repeat. And now if I repeat, it would be a draw. So I took the rook. If you're confused, he's in check here. That's why you can't take oh, my rook. Yeah, it looked like you were really confused over there. Yeah, yeah. Wait a yeah he, he's in check. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And again, with three against two, that would almost always be a draw. But there's two advantages other than the extra pawn. His pawns are far apart, which isn't good for him. Okay, think Indonesia, the Philippines. And another thing that I think of all the time, even on move one, which doesn't make any sense, um, which you guys have never thought of, and you never will, even when I tell you. You'll forget it one second after I tell you. Yeah. Is You see this H pawn that I have? When you have a side pawn and you have a bishop ending, you got to figure out whether you're controlling it. And if I had a white square bishop here and he had a white square bishop, I would assume it's a draw because if I lose these pawns, it's a draw because this pawn doesn't win. But this pawn does win. It's the right color for the bishop, so... That's a nice advantage that white has. Okay, so we continue. We move our pawns. And he plays h5 because he wants to trade pawns. So he doesn't want me to play g4 and h5 and f4 and g5. He wants, if you play g4, I'm going to take it. And now he's just going to chill. And he's like, if you ever play g4, I'm going to take it. And there's no pawns on the board. So if I do play g4 ever, what move should preface that? It's a move that should never preface it. That's why the exception proves the rule. F3. F3. Because then if he takes, I can take with F pawn, I'll have two connected pass pawns. If I play G4 and he takes it, and I take with the king, I don't think I'm going to win that. I mean, I might, but I don't think so. Okay. So I'm going to play F3, G4, and I'm happy. And I did. But he wouldn't let me. What a mean guy. And now, if I ever play g4, he'll take my h-pawn. So, and also my g-pawn's hanging. So I defend my g-pawn. Now, how am I going to defend my h-pawn and play g4? So he's just going to sit here and chill and draw the game. He's like, you can't do anything. You're stuck. Okay, but I'm patient. Now, obviously, if the bishop's not here, if it's somewhere else, I can play g4. But if it's you know, here, then watch it. Okay. Yeah, sometimes you have to do that. And I said never going back, but I did. Okay. And just waiting him out. And now I'm defending my pawn. I can defend my other pawn and then play g4. If he checks me, he's not attacking my pawn or this pawn. So I could play king e5 attacking his pawn. He'll play king f7 and then I could play g4 because his bishop's not on e1 anymore. So he left his bishop on, on this diagonal, so if I play g4, he can take my pawn. And now, finally, I can play g4, because I defended my h-pawn. Okay, and I did. Hooray! And he doesn't take, because that gives me two connected pass pawns, so he's like, well, what are you going to do? I'm very patient, though. I'm not in a hurry. What was wrong with against the bishop f right there? What, what, what's wrong with g5? There's nothing wrong with it, but what's right with it? If I play g5 and he moves his bishop away, I won't get my two connected pass pawns. I'll have one pass pawn and he's blocking it. be very hard to win then. Might be winning, but... I'm not worried about him taking my pawn and giving me two pass pawns. I don't worry about that. So I'll play g5 when I feel like it. And you know, I'll, if I play g5, it's all blocked. I, don't, I, don't want, I want to have some fluidity there. And then I guess if you ever push the f pawn and mm -hmm. just take it, and then you're he's still blocking. Yeah. Right? So it's not easy. Yeah. But I'm patient. Okay, repeat, always repeat. Okay, and now... I found a very funny winning method. I don't know if it works, but it did work. 
I'm going to go attack his pawn, which I couldn't really do before because I want to play king e5 to attack his pawn, but he has a dark squared bishop, so I can't get to e5. But d7 attacks his pawn. And you might be saying, why are you attacking his pawn? Because I want to take it. How do you defend your pawn? Well, how do you defend this pawn? King. If you play king f7, you undefended this pawn. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to take that pawn. I'm going to have two extra pawns. Then, if I start doing this, and you take with your king, I'm going to take that pawn. I'll have my two extra pawns again. So that's my winning plan. I'm going to go here. I'm going to take your pawn. If you defend your pawn, I'm going to take that pawn. So I'll have two extra pawns either way. And this pawn's going to go down the board, and if your king stops it, you're not defending this pawn. So that was my plan. Sounds like a good plan. I did my plan. Then I repeat it because I always repeat. Okay. Again, now the truth hurts. So you got to make a decision. Do you take this and then defend your pawn? Or do you defend your pawn and let me take that? Probably they both lose. And the point is, earlier in the lecture and in other positions, like in the first game, I was like, the pawns are isolated. And you guys are like, so? When pawns are isolated, it doesn't mean I'm going to take them, although I might. It means I can threaten them, and they can't protect each other, unlike my pawns. Yay, protecting each other. Okay? See, like the U.S. and, and, the, and then Philippines, right? Or Indonesia. What do you like? Which do you prefer? Which has more islands? Discuss. Philippines. I want a 3-0 here. What do you say? Philippines. You guarantee it? You're really confident. Yeah. yeah. You, because Indonesia has a lot of islands. Indonesia has a lot. I, don't know. I know. They have, I mean, they have a lot, too. Yeah. So the point of the story is when you have a lot of islands and you get attacked on one of those islands, government's like, yeah, whatever. Can't spread all islands. Leave me alone. But the U.S. doesn't like that. We have one and we defend it. Then if Puerto Rico gets hit by a hurricane, if Trump's like, that's an island. I don't know. Go away. I don't care about that. Right? But if it was like Texas, he'd be like, well, everything's except Galveston. Okay. So... When we get attacked on our mainland, then Trump cares if it's like Guam or Puerto Rico. He's like, yeah, whatever. It's islands. Okay. So when they're islands, it's hard to protect them all. It's easy to attack them. And even though, well, for islands, they're pretty close. It's not like one's over here and one's over there. But okay, they're still, they can't defend each other. Okay. So he's got to make a decision. And he took. So if he defends and I go here, what's the engine say? Well, I assume I'm winning. Man, it thinks I'm winning. Those are, those are some pretty big numbers. You know? And the fan got really loud, so that means I'm winning. If the fan is not loud, it's okay for him. Yeah. Ooh, that's, that's looking good, right? Yeah. Okay, so he had, he had the Sophie's choice, right? You guys get it. Well, you're pretty young, but you two get it. Okay. The difference is this is serious. Right, it's chess. Yeah, that was a movie. Okay, who was in the movie? Anybody? Okay. There you go. And that's all you have to know, right? No. That's right. You know what I'm talking about? No. You got nothing? <sighs> On Family Guy, they made fun of that. Peter says, I have a riddle. A guy breaks into your house and you have two children. He says he's going to kill one of them. You have to pick it. Which one do you pick? And, P and the dog says, that's not a riddle. That's just terrible. And then he says, wrong, the ugly one. That's, that was the right answer. Anyway, Peter didn't have a Sophie's choice. He had no problem. So the point of the Sophie's choice analogy was he can lose this way or he can lose this way. He decided to lose this way, which I guess is better because when I lost the other way, the computer was like plus 10. So, okay. And I got my two connected past pawns. The good player is always lucky. Notice how patient I am. I move my king around and I'm like, come on, lose already. And then they're like, all right, I give up. You don't have to win in like two moves. You can just keep pressing. Which current world champion does that a lot? Yeah, you know who you learned that from? The answer is not me. Well, it might have been me. I doubt it. We actually looked at chess once for like 45 minutes. We were just sitting there and I was like showing him stuff and he showed me stuff. True story. Not sure if you remember the stuff I showed. Okay. So what did Magnus do here? No, I was playing Jesse Cry. Okay. This is really sad for, for Janice Joplin when she saw this game. Okay. Anyway, so king f7, obviously. Otherwise, king takes e6. Once again, 
if this was opposite colored bishops, or if I had a white squared bishop not controlling this, I, probably this is all a draw. But same colored bishops, and I control the queening square. The good player is always lucky. Okay, here we go. We're got a the white squared. Couldn't the, you? I know it protect the g pawn, right? What, if I had a white squared bishop. Yeah. And he had a white squared bishop. Then he would play bishop takes g4, and when I take his bishop, it's a draw. Because I have a bishop in the wrong colored rook pawn. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. the, the truth hurts. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you got to have everything to win. You got to be lucky and figure it out beforehand. Yeah. And this is very important when you're trading. If you're like, well, this trade messes my opponent's pawn structure up, which was true. If I have the wrong colored you know, bishop for the rook pawn, then I can't do that. I got to be careful. And I'm thinking of that when I'm playing. Even when it started, I knew with the rook and bishops, I had the right colored h pawn. So that helps me. Okay, h5, bishop e3, obviously, stopping g5. Time to move my king back to where it can do some good. Okay, I did some good. And you guys are very proficient, so you know the king and pawning is a win. So my question is, how long will the engine be on where it announces mate? Might be like four minutes. I don't think it'll be less than four minutes. Or it'll be one second. That's what I meant. Well, this is mate in 12? That really surprises me. I thought it would be like 25. So I, I totally miscalculated this ending. All right, so it took it one second to see the mate here. So I won't play the machine for money. You guys know the famous Rady problem? There's more than one where there's a rook versus a pawn. That's it. And the rook moves back, the pawn moves up, and the rook goes back again. And blacks and zugs won. So about 20 years ago, approximately, I put it on an engine because the engines weren't any good then. And I want to see if the engine could solve it. And when I turned it on and said go, it announced mate in one second. So, because it, it sees all the way to mate because it was like 16 moves, so it was nothing. And there's very few legal moves. Now in this position, obviously, he's threatening to skewer my king and bishop. It's never too late to lose. Okay, so I play king e4. All right. And he, know, he knows the ending is lost. If he does skewer your bishop, can you make a draw out of it with your two fast pawns? The answer is maybe. But it's not worth figuring out. Like it. Well, we can, we can do it. Let's do it. All right. I'm going to say... Well, I don't know. I suspect it's losing, but I don't know. I suspect it's losing. I suspect correctly. Ooh. Yeah, I guess it was losing. Yeah, having pieces is good. You guys are like, I sacked a piece, and I'm like, ugh. Then you're like, but I have past pawns, and I'm like, ugh. And then the computer's like, yep. Yeah, pieces are good. Okay, so my suspecting was correct. Okay, so I didn't lose. Never too late to lose. And now, again, with the bishop situation, if it was the different color, you could just play bishop takes g5, and it's a draw. But my bishop's the right color. Whew. So he can't do that. Yeah, you know, the truth hurts. Okay, and now he broke a very important rule. Well, he broke two rules. He resigned, never resigned, and he should always play. You, you know the answer. Always play. Uh oh. <laughs> F8. Man, if you don't play Bishop F8, I recommend this move. You see what I'm saying there? So you got to play Bishop F8, or you could resign. He chose resigns because I go take his pawn. Also, you have to go here because you can't only play h6. You see what I'm saying? And then, man, you're going to be really unhappy here. Yeah, now you're not going to be too happy. You'll be a little happy, but not too happy. Then the announce is made instantly. I'm sure of it. Yeah. This is 12 moves also. This would be like six moves. Yeah. Computer defends well. Yeah. So after... after um, G6, he resigned. Yeah. So that took forever. Even the lecture took forever. And one of my strengths as a chess player, I don't have too many, is I don't care how long it takes. Now, you guys do. You guys are like, now, wait a minute. I was at a chess tournament, and I wasn't sure who was better. You were Zapata. And I noticed Zapata won in 20 moves, and you won in 80 moves, so Zapata's better. Now, what's funny about Zapata is he never wins. He's like me. He'll win in 90 moves. He don't care. Because yeah. he, he knows. 
right? Now, guys who were 21, 2200, they'll win in 20 moves. But me and Zapata, we, you know, we're equal for 80 moves. We don't care. Then we win. As long as we always win. And so, obviously, well, this guy's higher rated than I am. So, I'm not trying to beat him quickly. In fact, I've never beaten him. This is the only game I've ever beaten him. And this wasn't rated. This was on the internet. If it was rated, then I can't show you anything. I show you how games I lost. I lost in the National Open. I lost in the U.S. Championship. I drew him once. Yeah. That's pretty good. So I just lose to him. But in the U.S. Chess League, I beat him in a thousand moves. And in the end game, you have to be very patient. And in, with very few pieces and pawns, your kings can go on journeys. In all those positions, at least the ones I remember, my king was moving up the board and my opponent's king not so much. They were playing defense, making sure I didn't queen. So when you have an active king and an extra pawn, even when there's very few pawns on the board, you still have winning chances. You can still win. And Magnus wins a lot of games like this. In fact, it was either Ding or Yu Yang Yi. It was one of them. It was one of the top two Chinese guys. He was playing in the World Blitz like two years ago, and he won a bishop ending that never ended. I, I can't believe he won it. It was a blitz game, but he actually won on the board, and I just couldn't believe he won. It just it must take over 100 moves in a blitz game. But he went here, and then here, and then here, and then here, and then finally he broke through. And I was like, wow. Because I was sure he couldn't break through, but he did anyway. So this was easy compared to that. But you have to be patient. Sometimes it takes you a long time to win. And if you have a better king, and you have passed pawns, and you advance your passed pawns, and obviously my opponent had no counterplay, although he did threaten a skewer, I could have lost my bishop, as you pointed out. But I decided not to. Yeah. Okay, that was the end game lecture, and somehow they were my games because I was good ten years ago. Now I can't show you my games. Any questions? I'm talking to the people at home. Okay, you. No, incorrect. Okay, the guy was wrong. Okay. All right. See you guys next week. I'm out. <laughs>